So intersexual or sexual selection has typically been framed in terms of males competing oftentimes very aggressively for access to females, as you can see in the photographs, and females uh, choosing or preferring certain males, either it's some sort of trait that the males uh, have or some sort of uh, benefit that the males will convey to either the female or the offspring themselves. However, this reasoning can also be extended as to why uh, females may be willing to compete for access to certain males that are either preferred or have some, give some sort of benefit. And this results in female intersexual competition. And there can be a number of reasons for why females may be willing to compete for access to males. Uh, female candidates receive spermatophores from the males, and when resources are scarce, then the females may be willing to compete for the males that are still able to produce these nuptial gifts. Even in the absence of direct benefits, females may still be willing to compete for access to males if preferred males are sperm limited and not able to uh, mate with all the females that hope to mate with that particular male. In great snipes, the males perform on legs, and females will compete to mate with the most preferred males on the legs. Uh, female intersexual competition can also be more dynamic, when, such as when the operational sex ratio changes within the population, and when the, female, uh, when the population becomes more female biased, as in the case when the breeding season goes on with the sand goby, females will then compete for access to the males that have nest sites. The most well-studied area of female intersexual competition is due to males that provide parental care to the offspring. And oftentimes, this is a scenario in which a male and female have already mated, and a male is attempting to attract a secondary female to his territory. So this results in a change from monogamy to polygamy. However, if a change to polygamy uh, reduces the first female's breeding success, then we expect for the primary female to behave aggressively to any secondary females that attempt to settle on the male's territory, because this is going to reduce her reproductive success. And this has been found in the case such as starlings and filefish, in which female aggression is successful in preventing a secondary female from settling on the male's territory. And in the case of the shark nose goby, the female response is actually related to male quality, with females behaving more aggressively for higher quality mate. Uh, males indicating a more dynamic response that uh, takes into account the uh, benefits conferred by a particular male. The species that I've done my dissertation research on is the convict cichlids. And like the previous examples, they also have biparental care. However, unlike the previous examples, they have sequential and not simultaneous polygamy. So in order for a male to have more than one mate, he must either wait until the brood reaches independence, or in many instances, the male will actually abandon his first brood, leave the female to care for the offspring on her own, and will then mate with a new female. Males and females also differ in their breeding frequency. The Breeding season lasts from January through about the end of May in Central America, which is uh, during the long dry, dry season when water levels are stable. And males will often mate multiple times over the course of the breeding season, whereas females rarely mate more than once. There's also asynchrony in breeding in which, since females are not receptive all at once, there's a continual supply of potentially new mates for males to breed with. And for all these reasons, we decided to look at intersexual competition and the convict cichlid. Convict cichlids range from Guatemala down to Panama, and they inhabit lakes and streams. Uh, and the upper photograph is a picture from my field site, which is typical of a stream site, which is a little bit faster water flow, shallower water, and also fewer predators. The lower picture is also from my field site, in which it's a pool section, which is uh, more reduced water flow, uh, much higher predation, and deeper sections. The male and female will excavate underneath a rock, as in this picture, in which the female will then lay her eggs underneath the rock, 
And then in a separate experiment, we're able to utilize plastic flower pots in which the females would then lay her eggs inside there, which facilitated measuring fecundity for a separate experiment. It takes approximately a week for the eggs to hatch out, and then once the eggs hatch out and the offspring become free swimming, uh, also a term called fry, then for the next five weeks or so, the main form of parental care that the parents provide is protecting the offspring from predators, and the parents will behave very aggressively towards any fish that they perceive as a threat to the offspring. And in these photographs, you can see the size and coloration difference between the male and female, with the male being the larger of the two, and the female having uh, the more black and white characteristic pattern of the uh, name. Females have three distinct color phases, and each color phase corresponds to a particular phase of reproduction. Two of the phases are shown here. The one that's not shown is the non-breeding coloration, in which females are uh, drab, olive-colored, and the bars are not very distinctive. When females are reproductively receptive and have a higher ovary mass relative to the two other phases, they develop this jet black coloration in which there is gold on their ventral area as well as these neon iridescent flecks of blues and greens and orange along their fins. This coloration lasts for a few days after the eggs have been spawned as in the case of the female down here in which the female has already spawned the eggs but the she still has some of the residual coloration that's associated with the black phase or sexual stage. Once the fry become free swimming, the female transitions into the black and white color pattern you can see on the right. <coughs> Sexual females will also court uh, already paired males, as you can see in this video, in which the sexual female is the one in the front of uh, the gold coloration and the male and female are mated pair with the male in the middle here. And this uh, video we took over the course of an afternoon in which the females were engaged in fighting and very aggressive behavior towards one another. And the only time the male intervened was when the sexual female got too close to the fry, or he would also behave aggressively towards his own mate when she appeared to be too aggressive towards uh, this new female. And by the end of the afternoon, he had abandoned his uh, current mate, and then approximately a week later, we found him guarding Fry with this new female. So the question we asked is, do parental females respond more aggressively to an intruder that poses a threat not only to the offspring, but also to the female's mating status? We conducted this study in Lomas of Arbidol Biological Reserve in northwestern Costa Rica in the dry forest. And we conducted the study using four sites within the reserve, uh, which were separated along approximately a kilometer of stream section. And Station and Catarata were more stream type sections, shallower, whereas AP and Pozo were deeper pool sections. At the start of the day, we would hand capture. Uh, free swimming, non reproductive, and sexual females, and photograph them and measure them. And we tried to size match them as closely as possible for standard length. And once we had obtained the intruders that we were going to use for the day, we would find breeding pairs that were actively guarding offspring, place the intruder in a clear box in front of the pair, and do a 10 minute behavioral observation. Uh, using two observers to record the behavior of both male and female simultaneously. We randomized the order of the sexual and non-sexual intruder presentation, and then after the final presentation, we captured both the parents and offspring uh, to measure the parents for length and weight, and offspring for number and size. We used principal component analysis to summarize the recorded behaviors, I looked at the effect of parental and intruder standard length, offspring number and size on the behaviors. We also looked at the effect of parental standard length and parental behaviors on the residual number of young. The first principal component loaded positively for chases and frontal displays at other fish and negatively for time away for the brood. 
And these three behaviors combined all indicate parental care of the offspring. PC1 also loaded negatively for aggressive behaviors driven at the intruders. However, PC1 was not explained by any of the predictor variables, and the intruders did not cause an overall increase in aggression level of the parental females. PC2 loaded positively for aggression directed at the intruders, and to a much lesser degree, frontal displays of other fish, and it loaded negatively for chases of other fish and time spent away from the brood. Female standard length and intruder type were both, pos were both uh, correlated, significantly correlated with female PC2, and smaller females were more aggressive towards the intruders, and females were also more aggressive towards the sexual versus non-sexual intruder. The number of uh, offspring or fry was negatively correlated with fry size, so we used the residual number of fry for a brood to look at reproductive success of the females. And we found that smaller females had fewer fry for a given fry size compared to larger females and had lower reproductive success. In conclusion, aggression was by the parental females was directed at a perceived threat to their fitness and not an overall increase in their aggression levels. And this is uh, indicated by PC1, which was indicative of parental care and aggression of other fish, was not significantly affected by the intruder type. And so females were only increasing their aggression towards the sexual intruder and the perceived threat. Also, broods that are raised under female-only care raised fewer fry to independence than broods that have biparental care to independence. And so females are responding to the potential threat to their reproductive success if the male were to desert and mate with the new female. And so this increase in aggression may not be due to the male presence per se, but what the male's presence represents to her fitness. Smaller females may also need to be more aggressive in order to ensure the brood's success. And this is due to two factors. First, the females had smaller or lower reproductive success compared to larger females in terms of number of fry in the brood. And also, if the uh, female's uh, brood is not successful and fails, smaller females are going to have less energetic reserves in order to attempt a remating in the season. So the lower likelihood that they'll be able to remate combined, combined with the overall reduced reproductive success of the smaller females may be why they behave more aggressively to ensure that the male does not desert. And finally, we found no effect of male quality on female response. The previous study I conducted found that parental females do increase their parental care for higher quality males, and so we had the prediction that this may also carry over in terms of how females behave to a potential sexual arrival. However, there was not the uh, effect of male quality that we predicted, and females just behave uh, towards a sexual arrival regardless of their male's quality. I'd like to thank my funding sources as well as my field help and committee members for input before uh, the experiment as well as afterwards, and I will take any questions. Can we better move on?